Welcome to Her Story, the history of Southeast Asia told from her perspective. You'll discover historical figures, matriarchal societies, and contemporary female icons, and maybe learn about ourselves along the way. I'm your host, Agas Ramirez. In the next few episodes, we're taking a deep dive into the Manila Carnival, a two-week festival held during the early American colonial period, which culminated in the crowning of the queen and her court at an elaborate formal ball. For 31 years, young women from across the Philippines vied for the title, navigating racial prejudice and standards of beauty, and becoming an integral part of the nation-building process. This is Part 1, The Queen of the Orient, 1908. It's not a secret that Filipinos are obsessed with pageants. Catriona Gray, Pia Wurzbach, and Venus Roger, household names who have captivated millions of Filipinos across the world. Beauty pageants continue to inspire an almost cult-like following, especially among women and the queer communities. It's a very old joke that you shouldn't get your hair done after Miss Philippines loses at Miss Universe because the parloristas or salon attendants are probably not in the mood for it. There's a lot of criticism, of course, from so many angles about the merits of beauty pageants with respect to politics, feminism, beauty standards, and the place of women in society. Many people dismiss pageants as mere frivolity, shallow, something an intellectual wouldn't engage in. You'll notice that they say the same thing about many women's interests. Media targeted towards women, like romantic comedies, are often not taken seriously. There's a lot to unpack there. So we'll start with a question that many of us have probably asked ourselves before. Why do Filipinos love beauty pageants? The answers, as always, run much deeper than you might think. In this case, we'll have to go back all the way to 1908 at a little event called the Manila Carnival. In a nutshell, the Manila Carnival was an annual festival and celebration held in Manila during the early part of the 20th century. It was organized by the American colonial government as a way to showcase the Philippines' progress and development under American rule. It became an important cultural and social event, drawing visitors from all over the Philippines and other parts of the world. There were parades, music performances, floats, sporting events, and other activities, but the main event was always the coronation of Miss Manila Carnival. Note that the Manila Carnival predates the Miss Universe competition by 44 years. Right off the bat, we need to acknowledge that the Manila Carnival was, as most pageants are, very political. Alfred McCoy writes, quote, To build popular support for Citizens' Army, the neophyte Philippine state deployed a gendered propaganda with men strong, women weak, men the defenders, women the defended. Just as the new nation was personified as the feminine Filipinas in currency and propaganda, so young men were conscripted to defend her and her defenseless womankind. The government, in this transition to independence, skillfully manipulated public rituals and symbols to make a polarized gender dimorphism central to a new national self-image. The impact of militarization upon gender roles was most evident at the Manila Carnival, a grand pre-war festival celebrating the fecundity of the land and the glories of its people." Unquote. Clearly, the Manila Carnival was never just entertainment. It was a way to project the image of a nation to as many people as possible. As historian Don Boholano Mabalon says, Filipino beauty queens embodied the best aspirations and virtues of the new nation. According to Genevieve Alva Clotario, author of Beauty Regime, which is the main reference for this episode, preparations for the first carnival began in 1907. The Manila Carnival Association, which was sanctioned by the U.S. colonial state, made these plans right when the Americans were beginning the next phase of colonial consolidation. 
What does that mean? Well, in 1907, the newly established Philippine Assembly had its first elections of Filipino representatives. Sergio Smeña became Speaker of the Assembly. Manuel Alquezon was the majority leader. And Vicente Singson was the minority leader. The first two would later become presidents. At the time, racism and racial tensions were still very high. For example, American military and civilians who built institutions and businesses in Manila still wanted to exclude Filipinos from the highest levels of government. They also didn't want Filipinos in certain social spaces that they felt were theirs. Clotario writes, quote, a promotional brochure for the 1909 Manila Carnival claimed that the carnival celebrated a great, beautiful, fertile group of islands, which for centuries peacefully slumbered apart from the world activities of the day, that suddenly, by chance of war, found itself in the very middle of the highway of progress. The brochure went on to reduce the Philippine-American War to an insurrection of misplaced anger, claiming, The insurrection army of the Filipinos brought into existence in the struggle against Spanish supremacy, was unfortunately directed by these people against their liberators, unquote. Hell of a PR spin, isn't it? These people simply don't know what's good for them, that's all. So they needed a way to show Philippine-American friendship and the success of U.S. colonialism. The Manila Carnival was a big way to do that. It had attractions that Western tourists might enjoy and structures like the Hippodrome that showed that modernity has truly arrived in the islands. The pageant was, at the outset, a popularity contest where the lady receiving the highest number of votes, whether American, Filipina, or European, would be proclaimed queen. And this was capitalism. After all, the carnival needed to make money, so the organizers targeted the wealthiest families in Manila. Spanish, American, or Filipino, it didn't matter, as long as they had the social and economic standing to make this work. They would convince them to enter one of their family members into the competition. Then these families would have the money to campaign for their wives or daughters or sisters, increasing the popularity of the carnival and making fundraising easier for the organizers. Within this tense environment, the first Manila Carnival was held at Wallace Field in Luneta Park in 1908. There were at least two reasons it was controversial. First, the pageant itself went against gender norms. While Filipinas participated in parades and various forms of pageantry in the Spanish colonial period, they were all religious. Flores de Mayo or Santa Cruzan, which were dedicated to patron saints or the Virgin Mary. The Manila Carnival was secular and for-profit, which they feared would cheapen the image of the Filipina. To many members of the media and local elite, it resembled prostitution. One political cartoon from the time showed white men, members of the Manila Carnival Association, searching for carnival queens in Manila brothels. Organizers tried to address this issue by including some Catholic elements, like holding it in February just as the Lenten season began, but by and large, it was secular and modeled after cosmopolitan celebrations like you would find in Europe and Latin America. There was also an energy of subversion, of misrule, of the opportunity to forget power and social hierarchies, even just for the carnival. In the early days, they used imagery inspired by the Italian masquerade, like harlequins, jesters, tarts, and vicars, and the Red Devil. The Red Devil was the mascot of the carnival, a grinning red creature with bat-like wings hovering over the chaos of the festivities. You can imagine how the traditional elites must have felt about that. Second, they made the pageant a democratic exercise. A, a paid one, but hey, it was like the original American Idol, but it was paper ballots instead of text votes. These ballots were printed through magazines like Liwai Wai and counted every week between December 7, 1907 and January 15, 1908. Now you already know about the racial tension that was happening and this kind of made it worse. The top four candidates were Mrs. Henry M. Jones and Mrs. Israel Beck, both white American women, Maria de la Cruz Baldazano, a white Spanish woman, and Leonada Limhap, a Filipina. During the first few weeks of counting ballots, Jones led the competition and Limjap came in fourth. 
Hey, Tagalog column, muling pagsilang, published in the anti-colonial newspaper El Renacimiento, complained that the reason Filipinas were behind in the count was that there were too many Filipina candidates and just very few American and Spanish ones. The Filipino vote was being split. Who are the other candidates, you wonder? Well, thanks to Alex D. R. Castro, writer and famed collector of Manila Carnival memorabilia, we have their names. They were... Josefina Ocampo, known as the Perla ng Quiapo, Pura Villanueva of Iloilo, Pilar Reyes Cobarubias, hometown unknown, Nenita Lokban of Esteban de Infante, Filomena Francisco, a Liceo de Manila student, Maria Paz Zamora and Trinidad Zamora, sisters from Intramuros, Carmen Francia of Pangsanhan, Felicidad Villarica, known as Talagang Tagalog or Truly Tagalog, Maria Paz Rafael Yanco, Pepita Rodriguez Serra, and Rufina Policarpio of Navotas, who was said to be the most beautiful girl there, patriotic, educated, she can face anyone by tapat ng loob. These titles remind me of how we refer to Pinoy Big Brother candidates today. It's always something like, devoted daughter of Cavite. I always thought the show invented it, but apparently we've always done that sort of thing. Anyway. Clotario mentions that El Renacimiento continued to faithfully report on the carnival. And thank you so much for that, because we know what happened next, and it was drama. Just all the drama. So much drama we could make an entire miniseries. Okay. The disparities in the votes worsened to the point that people became suspicious about it. Members of the press involved in vote counting discovered ballot irregularities. Some American publications printed four ballots per purchase rather than single ones. Then some unapproved tabloids like Sentinel printed ballots too, and perhaps most damning, a significant number of ballots in favor of one or two candidates was found in the very office of the Carnival Association. Allegedly, some association members were involved in the cheating. So they had no choice but to cancel voting entirely. They decided instead that there would be two appointed winners, Queen of the Orient, the Filipina candidate, and Queen of the Occident, the American candidate. Mrs. Israel Beck, who was in the lead, backed out because the pageant was, quote, no longer one of popularity or genuine balloting by one's friends, unquote. Yikes. Marjorie Colton was named Queen of the Occident, and Leonada Limhap was named Queen of the Orient. But Leonada Limhap didn't accept the title because she was going on vacation to Japan. That was the press release. And yeah, that sounds reasonable enough priorities, am I right? But historians claim that her father, Mariano Limhap, didn't like all the attention that his daughter's public display was bringing to the family, so they made her back out. After that, another queen of the Orient was declared, and if you're Filipino, you've heard of her before, Purificacion Garcia Villanueva, more popularly known as Pura Villanueva Calao. At 22 years old, Pura was already a well-known political figure, having established the Asociación Feminista Ilonga, a feminist group instrumental in pushing for women's right to vote. We could spend an entire episode talking about Pura Villanueva Calao. Wink, wink. I wish I could say the 1908 drama ended there, but it did not. No, ma'am. They attempted to show in the media that Pura and Marjorie were equals, same height, same hair. Even how they were seated side by side attempted to show equality and fairness. See the title card for this episode. But already, people felt that having two queens, one of them white, was just underscoring racial segregation. One of the main features of the carnival was a water parade in which the Queen of the Orient, Pura, with her entourage, rode barges out into the Manila Bay to receive the Queen of the Occident, Marjorie Colton, and her entourage. This was meant to show the Filipinos' acceptance of the Americans, a friendly concession of power to the colonizers. On the ground, controversy gnawed at the edges of the festivities. One clear example was when Pura and her entourage failed to attend a major carnival ball, Newspapers wondered if she went on strike. From El Renacimiento. Villanueva boycotted the event because the king and queen of the Orient, as owners of this land, were not given due honors. And that was maybe pretty accurate because while the association arranged transportation for Marjorie to take her from the parade marker of the festival's day one to the coronation grandstand, Pura didn't get any. And it's not like she could get an Uber or something. 
the Filipino contingent had to find their own transportation. And when they did arrive, the guard wouldn't let them in because they didn't have tickets. I'm not sure if this was just incompetence, but how do you not recognize the difference between a carnival goer and a pageant competitor? And at this point, their faces were plastered literally everywhere. So this just fueled the rumors about unequal treatment of the queens. And mind you, this was Pura Villanueva, daughter of a powerful Hispanic mestizo landowning family, and she was still being discriminated against? Obviously, the entire thing was a facade, and I'm sure Pura knew this, but she saw it through to the end and became a very powerful national symbol. Newspapers contrasted Marjorie and her entourage's simple and ordinary attire with Pura and her entourage's luxurious costumes. They praised Pura for being, quote, proud without putting on airs, imposing without pretension, a product of her refined blood and birth, end quote. Unwittingly, the Americans gave Filipinos a way to share their anti-colonial and nationalist sentiments without violating any restrictions. You see, a few years earlier, sedition laws were passed, so advocating independence against the U.S. was illegal. They even banned the Philippine flag. But at the carnival, they didn't need the flag. They just needed Pura. She enabled nationalist expression. As Clotario says, beauty pageantry became a critical apparatus for the promotion of Philippine nationalism. After the coronation, Governor General James Francis Smith told his boss back home that the event was a magnificent success and there was unanimous demand for its repetition in 1909. Next time, we'll talk about what did happen in 1909 why the carnival was suspended for two years, how it came back into fashion, and became an increasingly important part of local society and politics. The song in this episode is Vaudeville by Andre Lagoy. Vaudeville is an indigenized form of vaudeville introduced in the Philippines around the time of the Manila Carnival. Hope you enjoyed his song inspired by it. Check out Andre Lagoy's music through the links in the description box. Thank you to our patrons, Alisa, Beverly, Karen, Caro, Shami by Milish, Jennifer, Christina, Raul, Raymond, Matt, Shireen, Charlie, and Yati. If you want to join the Patreon, you can give as little as $1 to get a copy of the show notes with all the references, a shout-out at the end of the next episode, and access to bonus episodes. We have Nyagya de Pinate, the Harbor Master of Gresik, an interview with Haldi Patra on the Minangkabao Matriarchal Society, Mayin Tafan and the Chrome Clone, Queen Sardiathai and the War Elephants, Pazma Marquez Benitez and Dead Stars, The Rise and Fall of the Achenese Queens, 1641-1699, and The Women of Number 14, Le Boulith. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Her Story C Pod. That's Her Story, S-E-A, Pod. There are so many more stories to tell, and we're just getting started. This podcast was hosted and edited by Agas Ramirez. Thank you for listening, and we hope to see you again next time. Maraming salamat. Sa sa fix yo, ang kalendaryo.